Would you bow your heads with me and, and we'll pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for an opportunity just to open up your word. God, I ask that you would speak during this time, God, that um, your presence would just be known here and that we would walk away um, just drawing closer to you and uh, just, just learning what you have for us in your word. And we say this in your son's name. Amen. So we are continuing in the series um, on the seven churches of Revelation. So if you would, could you turn to the book of Revelation? Uh, it is the last book in the Bible. We are going to be in chapter 2, uh, verse 18 today. Chapter 2, verse 18. So we've been looking at different churches and what Jesus has to say to them. And uh, you can relate this uh, to a doctor's visit. Um, they go... Uh, and, and Jesus is telling them, you know, some of the positives, some of the negatives, some of the things that they could work on, some of the things that they're doing a good job of. And uh, it made me think this week of a, a time when I went to the doctors about a year ago. Um, I was in a pretty, pretty bad car accident, and uh, I thought I was good. I thought I was fine. Um, but I ended up going at about 1 in the morning to the doctor's. And uh, I'm there, and they, they do all the scans, they do all the tests on my brain and my shoulder, and they found out that it's pretty hollow in there, but uh, that's okay. And uh, that was a joke, but um, I'm sitting in the waiting room, waiting for, for my name to get called, and they call James. And so my mother was the one that drove me there, so uh, we get up and we go. And uh, she's taking us to the room. Now this story is going to be a lot better for you when I give you some, some foreknowledge. There's two Jameses in the waiting room. So they call James, I get up, my name's James, I follow her, and they take me into the room, and it's not like one of those rooms where um, they're just going to talk with you, they took me into a room with like a bed, and uh, so she, I go in, and I sit in the chair, I don't sit in the bed, I'm fine, there's nothing wrong with me, and she brings out that gown that she wants me to wear, and uh, she goes, go ahead, put on the gown, and she starts prepping the bed and making it for me, and I'm like, what's going on? They never told me any results of anything. I'm like, am, am I okay? Uh, I, if I'm going to put on a gown with a butt flap, I need to know what's wrong. <laughs> like, you know, I'm not just going to get in the bed. And so she's like, oh, no, you're, you're good. The, the doctor will be here shortly. I'm like, no, I, what is wrong with me? I, I don't understand what's going on. And um, I'm going to be real vulnerable and honest with you guys. I, I literally looked at my mom and my voice like trembled like, like, mom. Am I going to be okay <laughs> like that? And she's like, I'll go find out. And so the nurse goes and gets the doctor, and my mom goes out, and I finally, you know, put on the gown, and it's cold. And I get, I get in the bed, and I'm sitting on top of it like I, like I don't belong, you know what I mean? Like I'm not going to get comfortable. And, uh, you know, don't judge me, but I'm doing what you would do. I'm like, God, I'll never sin again. <laughs> Just, you know, I'll go to China, I'll go to Africa, I'll do whatever you want. Just, just let me be okay. And uh, so sure enough, the nurse comes in just super embarrassed and, uh, and, and kind of awkwardly. She's like, I'm so sorry, you're not the right James that we were looking for. And it's just like, Whew. now I tell you that story uh, not for just the sake of uh, making everybody feel comfortable and, and, you know, sharing with you my embarrassment, but... Uh, I, I share it with you because could you imagine if they called James again and the James had actually had something wrong, was taken into an office, and they, he got my results. Could you imagine if he had whatever he had going on, but they told him, you know what, you're good to go. Because that was really my results. I, that I was fine, that I was good, there was nothing wrong. And so you could imagine if it, it would be a tragedy to send this other James off who's not well but make him think that he's well. I tell you this story because as we look at this church today, the church of Thyatira, it's going to sound extreme. It's going to sound super intense. And the point that I want to get is that if there's something wrong, it needs to be addressed. We can't just say everything's good when it's not good. Does that, you know what I mean? It, it would be... Um, it wouldn't be loving, it wouldn't be correct for Christ to just say, yeah, you're doing a great job when really they're not. Um, this is why, you know, you have kids, you raise them up, you, you, you got to let them know right and wrong to just let them go on thinking that everything's okay, thinking that everything's good, that, that they're number one. I mean, it just wouldn't be right. You know, you got to tell them when, when something's wrong. And so um, that's a forewarning that this is going to be brutally honest from Jesus. So Revelation 2, 18. We're going to read the whole section together and we'll go back through it. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, 
These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of their ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my Father, I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. A little intense, right? A little, little brutal. <clears throat> what's interesting about this is that Jesus often speaks to them and he uses words and, and concepts that the city or the culture or the church would understand. And so it's important to have a little bit of a background about Thyatira before we continue. Uh, first off, it's the smallest church, the smallest city um, that of all the seven churches in this passage. It's the smallest one and it's really um, insignificant to be totally honest with you. Last week was a capital city and it had governmental importance. And this one's really more of a, a blue collar working city. There was a lot of trading. Um, there was blacksmith, there was pottery, there was, there was linens, there was merchants. It was a city that people were going in and out of. Um, in fact, one of Paul's uh, converts in the book of Acts was from Thyatira and sure enough, she traded um, linens and garments. And so many people think that maybe this is how the church started was from Paul's convert. Um, but needless to say, they were a city that wasn't very big, wasn't very important to most people's eyes. And so when Jesus writes to them, he says, these are the words of the Son of God, meaning this is a letter from Jesus, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Using a symbol of metals, no doubt they would have you know, been really common with that, but this is also a symbol of, of judgment and, and intensity. Um, to hear that somebody's eyes are like blazing fire, that should get your attention. Um, when, when you see a police officer and you've done something wrong, you get the blazing fire look, right? And like, just give me my ticket, okay. So you get that this is going to be a stern message from that. Verse 19, though, gives give some of the positives of this church. He says, I know your deeds, your love, and faith your service and perseverance, that you are now doing more than you did at first. This is fun. We get to talk about some positives. How many of you guys like some positive stuff first? Get it going? Okay. Here's some positive stuff. This church was really loving. They cared for people. They uh, served other people. They were others-minded. They were consistent in their faith. And they were really big into doing deeds and service for others. And so that's good. You can imagine this church was probably growing because of that. They had a big community outreach. They, they were others-minded. And it's kind of fun to compare this church with other churches that we've talked about. If you remember the church of Ephesus, the, the loveless church. They were uh, really doctrinally strong, but they had no love. And then this church over here, they're full of love, but doctrinally way far off. And so I, I want to maybe suppose to you that right off the bat here that we could find a balance between being a loving church, a loving person, but also carrying the truth of Jesus. I think it's unfortunate, but a lot of times as Christians, we either fall into one camp or the other. We, we're Bible thumped and verse quoting, let me tell you where you're wrong, or we're just love and grace. Ah. I'm not doing that in second service again, but... but you know, we, we get on these two extremes, and it's like there's this middle between having a love for people and a love for where they're at, but also having a love for the Word of God and doctrine and being biblically sound. And, and so let's, let's kind of pull from both churches and find a happy medium. Um, they had a love for, for people, like I said, a love for service, and uh, 
it, that's really a, a dying art, a dying thing, but because um, we often look to receive from people, and they were really good about giving and serving. Um, I'm going to be brutally honest. Some, some of my best friends are, are part of this church, and they're a couple named Stevie and Willie. Um, you know, you may have known them, you may not know them, but here's the thing about them, is Willie is super talented at everything. He's mechanically inclined, good at electrical, he flies planes for a living. Do you know what it's like to be like, hey dude, what'd you do today? He's like, oh, I flew to Catalina and back, what'd you do? It's like, I read my Bible. <laughs> I mean, I get spiritual and say, you know, I studied really hard, but, and, uh, but he's good at everything. And Stevie's a, a hairstylist, and, and so it's really easy, though, being a friend of theirs, to want to wanna invite Willie over and be like, oh, man, that light switch does not work. What a bummer. <laughs> uh, is my car leaking oil? It is. <laughs> or when you see Stevie, oh, man, my, I need a little haircut, huh? Do you know anybody that does really cheap haircuts? <laughs> a lot of times we, 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 when we have people and we interact with people, we're looking to get, receive, Take, what can I get from you? I've never had the struggle with being wealthy, but I can imagine that people are always wanting to get and take and, and work an angle, and, and what can I get from you? And so just to, you know, give this church their, their one thing that they had going on, they were a loving church. They were about serving people. They didn't see people as an opportunity to get, but an opportunity to serve. So now that we've taken care of the positives of this church, are we ready to tear them apart? Yeah? All right. Verse 20, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. Now, this woman's name might be Jezebel for reals, or this might just simply be a look back at the Old Testament of a woman named Jezebel. The reason it might be a look back to her is because the very same things that we see here about Jezebel is the same that we see in the Old Testament. Jezebel was a woman who married uh, the king of Israel at that time and brought in complete destruction, chaos, and corruption. Um, she was tearing down the altars to God. She was removing all the prophets of that time or all the priests of that time. And then what she was doing is she was introducing worship of Baal. And with that came uh, just sexual immorality, weird practices, and, and craziness like that. And uh, so don't name your daughter Jezebel. <laughs> it's like naming your son Judas. Just don't do that. Um, but that was Jezebel of the Old Testament. And so when we read here that, that she was um, prof claiming to be a prophet and preaching and teaching um, really believers and Christians that sexual immorality and the beginning of idolatry is acceptable. That's pretty gnarly stuff. Um, and so before we really get to the, really the consequences of that, I just want us to really settle in on, on how extreme this really is. Because you can imagine that there was real deal believers in this church, and they're inviting friends, and they're inviting family. They're, they're serving people, right? And they come to church, and they meet Jezebel, and she's like, yeah, Adultery, that's fine. You're good. If you want to worship Jesus or maybe a different God, that's all right. Could you imagine that today in your church? I know for sure if, if there was something like this, if some woman told me that adultery was okay, my wife would become, you know, Kung Fu Panda or something, you know. I shouldn't have said a panda. Just a karate kid, okay? She, she would go crazy. Could you imagine what division that's going on in this church? Homes are literally being split up. Adultery is acceptable. It's encouraged. Last week, we had a church that was slipping and falling and compromising. This week, we have a church that's full-blown corrupt. They've accepted, embraced, enjoyed sin. They're allowing it to spread. They're not dealing with it. In fact, they're encouraging it. Now, you can imagine how extreme to hear sexual immorality being okay. And the eating of food sacrificed to idols sounds, you know, not as bad. But really, it's the beginning of accepting the idols, accepting idolatry. It's accepting the feast and the other festives that these other beliefs were, were having. 
it's okay now to worship other gods in the church. That's pretty gnarly. Jesus isn't having eyes of fire and feet of burnished bronze for the sake of they slipped and fell in sin. They were rolling in it. They were enjoying it. So he says to them, her, I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. This isn't, again, somebody that didn't know better. Jesus has convicted her, has made it very clear that this is wrong, but she is unwilling to repent, meaning she's willingly sinning. There's a lot of grace, there's a lot of mercy for, for sin. But it's really hard when somebody's blatantly saying, you know what, I know what God says, but I just don't really care. I, I know what you want me to do, but no, I'm good. Verse 22, so I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of their ways. First thought here, Jesus is still giving opportunity for repentance. Isn't that crazy that the grace of God goes all the way to a woman who is preaching that adultery is acceptable? Grace can go as far as somebody who's in idol worship. Grace can go as far as murder. Grace can go as far as being a thief. You know, was, I've had a lot of people in my life that have been super influential and, and somebody that I'll, I'll never forget and I'll always appreciate was, was I had a teacher in, in Bible college and he was teaching prison ministry. And uh, he shared his testimony, and he, he would always say that he did ministry from the inside out. <laughs> um, he was doing it from the inside. And uh, he was uh, a drug addict and, and, and strung out, and he made a poor decision, and uh, he ended up murdering somebody. And while in prison, he got saved. And not only did he get saved, but he took Bible courses inside, the Lord worked on him, worked on him, worked on him. And soon he became the pastor of his prison. He became the first ever Bible college graduate from out of prison. And it was pretty amazing. On, on his, his court day, he had um, Chuck Smith show up to his, his court and give him um, a testament of approval that he could be released. God's grace goes so far. His love and his mercy goes all the way to those who are preaching and teaching sexual immorality and, adult, and ad idolatry. He's still giving them time to repent. But they are unwilling. Verse 23, I will strike her children dead then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will pay each of you according to your deeds. Now, when I first read this, I thought, she probably had a lot of kids, but Bible jokes, okay. And uh, <laughs> yeah, you guys can help me with a laugh every now and then, that'd be good. Uh, but her children wasn't actual children. It was those that were following her ways, following in that belief. Um, it's really, really clear in Scripture um, that sin is not tr passed down by generations and generations. A lot of people would think that, um, that when a child was blind, oh, the parents must have sinned. That's not how God operates. That's not how God works. Um, he, he cares for the individual. We're, we're held responsible for our own deeds. And so when he says the children, it's, it's meaning those who are following in her ways, following um, what she is teaching. And it says that all the churches will know that I am he who searches the hearts and minds, and I will pay each of you according to your deeds. Now, We've all experienced sin in here, correct? Can I, get a, can I get a hand raise here? Anybody in here a liar? Anybody ever lie before? Doug, you better raise both your hands up right now. Thank you. <sighs> Tough crowd. But, and we've all experienced the pain that sin brings. We've experienced the, I've made a bad decision and now I've got to deal with the consequences of that decision. And Jesus is saying very clearly that each of us will be held accountable according to our deeds especially those that are unwilling to repent, unwilling to turn to Jesus. The beautiful part of this is that this is an opportunity for us to make clear the gospel and that you do not have to be held accountable for your deeds 
in the eternal sense. But yes, we are accountable for our deeds here today. But if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, ask him to forgive you and to make you clean and to repent, we are not accountable for the mistakes that we make in this life and eternity. Instead, we get to be side by side with Jesus Christ in heaven. You know, everybody will find themselves before the Lord. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. But some will do it out of shock and awe. But others will do it as a thing of praise. I want to do it as something that I've already lived my life for, that he is the Lord. You know what I mean? I don't want to find out that he is when I die. (laughs) Jesus' grace, his mercy, his love will overcome our deeds, our shortcomings. All 200 of us in here. It will go beyond anything that we've done in this life. The key word in that, though, of course, would be to repent. Can you imagine being part of this church and getting this letter? That would be a pretty big eye-opener. He not only is wanting those of this church to read it, but also to other churches that they might see what's going on here and learn from it. And that's sort of fitting because what are we? We're a church looking at it, learning from it. Hopefully we don't have to make the same mistakes. I always said, when I, because when, I have an older brother, it's like walking into a minefield and I know when he steps on a mine, don't step there, you know, and, and thankfully we have an even younger brother who's uh, watched both of us make mistakes and uh, he still finds them somehow, but uh, <laughs> he's not here today, so <sighs> throwing him under. But we can look at this church and learn from it. We don't have to fall into the same pitfalls. Um, I hope and pray today that, that um, maybe we don't have uh, sexual immorality or, or idolatry in our hearts, but nonetheless, we have something that we can repent of, something we can turn away from. We can look at this corrupt church and, and realize that we don't want to be corrupt people. We don't want the sins of this church to be similar to the sins of our hearts and our lives. Now I say to the rest of you in verse 24 in Thyatira, To you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets. I love how this this whole theology and ideology was made out to be something cool, deep secrets, right? It almost sounds like, I want to know the deep secrets, but... They weren't really deep secrets. Anyways, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. This is my favorite part of the whole section right here, 26. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my father. Stop right there. I love that it, one, uses pottery again, a a physical element that many of them would be used to. But the other thing is this. We have eternity with Jesus ruling alongside of him to look forward to. To those who hold to the word of God, to those who live their lives, who ask for forgiveness, repentance, and accept Jesus into their lives, they will rule and reign with Jesus Christ. That's something that, you know, it's not like, oh, yeah, that's kind of cool. Like, woo. That's like, oh, my gosh. That's, that's life-changing. You ever look forward to, to a holiday when it gets closer, right? Christmas music starts coming on. Uh, like, Christmas trees come out in the stores, and it's like, you know, February. But, you know, the, you know, the, the things start coming on. There's, there's sales, and you start to see lights. And Maybe I'm young, but I still love Christmas, and it's like, it's around the corner, man. It's, it's coming, and, and, and there's some excitement in that. And Man, Christmas is, is nothing in comparison to getting to be face-to-face right there with Jesus as our Lord and Savior and getting to rule with him. How beautiful is that? And I think, oh my gosh, I, I'm a liar and a thief, and I made mistakes, but I get to do that. We get special privileges We have so much in eternity to look forward to. We get to be those who are victorious. Those who in the end will be given authority over the nations to to rule with with Christ. Verse 28 says, I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says. There's a lot of debate and a lot of thought on what this morning star is. 
Some think that this is um, just Jesus himself. Um, some believe that it's, it's a look at other things in the book of Revelation um, that, that we just simply don't have time to go over. But, but nonetheless, um, I feel so compelled, so, so led to just really make it clear how, how beautiful eternity will be. That there's, there's so many things that we can turn and look to and, and try to satisfy our lives with, but nothing can do what Christ can do for us. He gives me forgiveness, he gives me hope, he gives me a future, he gives me eternity, he gives me security, he gives me <laughs> just everything I could ask for. And no doubt in this church there were some who were still believers, but they were certainly starting to drift and starting to follow other things. And I just want to encourage all of us to really stay the course of Christ, to not get distracted to keep eternity on the forefront of our minds, to remember how good Jesus is as if it's like just a brand new thing. His grace is new for you this morning. Maybe you got in the car and yelled at somebody. His grace is new for you again here at church. Your kid was taking forever to get ready and get out of bed. His grace is new again. I don't know what you said under your breath, but you know his grace is new again. Tomorrow morning, you go back to work, and your boss, ugh, his grace is new. Every day we get to walk and live and be with Jesus. And for some of you, you know, I, I don't know everybody's story, but there's a chance that you don't have Jesus. You've never repented of your ways. You've never turned and accepted Christ. This morning, I really want to give you an opportunity I think it would be a shame to, to talk about how dark and evil and, and terrible sin is and, and how great Jesus is, but never lead you all the way to it, you know? The beautiful thing is you're surrounded by people who have already accepted Christ, who would see, like nothing more to, to see you accept him. If you would like to receive Christ this morning, we're going we're gonna to pray. Um, and I'm not going to make you come forward. We're, we're not going to do anything weird. But we're just going to pray. And, and if you'd like to accept Christ, let me give you a moment. Just maybe raise your hand and, and just ask the Lord to come into your life. Um, maybe this is for somebody watching online. Maybe this is for somebody in this room. But no doubt, we need to repent and come to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. I thank you that we can look at even a corrupt church, and pull so much from it. God, I pray that, um, that your spirit would just come upon this place. That if there's somebody's heart in here that, that, that needs you, that is desperate for you, but just has not accepted you, God, that they would know that you are real, know that you love them, know that there's forgiveness and grace and your love for them. God, I pray for maybe some of us in here who have, who have been Christians for a long time, but we just need to hear yet again to repent and turn to you. With every eye closed, if you're here today and, and maybe you've never accepted Jesus, um, but you would like to, feel free to, to just shoot your hand up at this moment. Um, there, there's nothing more that, that God would love to see than that. Amen. God bless you. God is so good. Amen. Amen. Church, if you would, if you would pray this prayer with me aloud, just, just nobody's praying by themselves, nobody's praying alone, would you just pray this with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I repent of my ways. I want you into my life. Make me new. Make me clean. Thank you, Lord. God bless you guys so much. I, I just want you to know also as, as I'm wrapping up and getting done and getting away from here, um, if there's something you need to get right with the Lord, you need to just pray, you need to talk with him about something, maybe something's going on that's deep, that's heavy. The pastors, we're all going to be up here. Um, I would love to talk to you. Uh, Pastor Scott would love to talk to you. We'd love to pray with you, encourage you. Maybe it's something, whatever. We're here. That's what we're for. God bless you guys.